you know, as long as long as we're on this, then there's the whole thing with uh, blood donation. So blood donors, um, blood donors have lower iron levels, and they've been found to have lower rates, well, lower mortality rates. Put it that way. Um, to to get around there, there's a problem in studying blood donors um, like in this way because of the healthy user effect. Um, ba basically, you know, healthy user bias is the same thing that I was talking about when I, with regard to these epidemiological studies about meat. In the case of blood donors, they're healthier than other people to begin with, generally speaking. Um, you know, otherwise they would not be allowed to donate blood. Um, and they, they probably wouldn't voluntarily you know, not, not as much voluntarily go out and want to get blood in the first place if they didn't feel well. So, and then they have to pass a, a fairly basic health screening. So blood donors are healthier and then they have lower mortality rates. Okay. So how do you uh, deal with this healthy user effect? Well, you can compare one group of blood donors to another group of blood donors. You can compare frequent blood donors who might give blood several times a year to infrequent blood donors who might give blood, say, once every three years. Um, and you find that the frequent blood donors have lower mortality rates than the infrequent blood donors. Um, oh, and a, another study looked at current blood donors versus um, former blood donors. So people who had become too old to give blood anymore, they weren't giving blood and they compared mortality rates. They found that current blood donors had better health and lower mortality rates. Um, so red blood cells use hemoglobin um, to carry oxygen, hemoglobin. Iron is central to hemoglobin, it's, it's a requirement. So red blood cells, are the quantitatively most important store of iron in the body. So when you donate blood, you, you are effectively getting rid of a lot of iron. So um, all, all this points to iron. There have, been, um, there have been studies on therapeutic phlebotomy. In other words, basically controlled studies. So you get rid of this healthy user effect and you find all kinds of interesting health benefits from therapeutic phlebotomy. So why does iron accumulate? I mean, we, we eat a lot of things, but why does iron particularly accumulate? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So it's not just a matter of, um, you know, you know, for example, when I talk, when I talk about iron, I often get the, you know, the, the reply or the question, well, what about eating meat? It's got a lot of iron. So it's, but it's not a matter of just consuming iron. Iron is tightly regulated by, uh, by hormones and other mechanisms in the body. So if you have adequate iron stores, you should be absorbing very little from your diet. Um, human beings and, and, and other, and mammals in generally have no regulated means of getting rid of iron. Once it's in you, it's pretty much in you. The, the amount that you, the amount of iron that you lose naturally is very little, uh, a milligram a day or something like that. Um, and, and so, but what, what we do have is regulated means of um, increasing or decreasing the absorption of iron from our diet. So hepcidin is one of the main pro, uh, hormones that regulates uh, our iron absorption. And, and so um, this, is, this should be finely tuned. However, it's been found that, so you ask me, why do we, why do we accumulate iron? Well, people with metabolic syndrome and, and diabetes and fatty liver and so on have uh, typically have higher iron levels. So there seems to be a, a metabolic derangement going on where these, these people are um, not controlling the absorption of iron from their diet effectively. 
um, that that is that is one reason. Um, so, I mean, in in the United States, a recent study found that eighty eight percent of people were metabolically unhealthy. They had they had one or another sign of metabolic syndrome. Um, so these people could probably be expected to be accumulating iron at a faster rate than if they were healthy. There are other aspects of it too. For the past several decades in the United States, uh, flour and cornmeal has been fortified with iron. There have been other countries that have done this and some of them have quit doing it because they have realized the harm from doing this. The idea of course is to, um, to help people that are iron deficient um, in, in a modern developed country like the United States, it's, it's a, a low single di digit fraction of the population that is potentially iron deficient. However, when they fortify the iron, fortify flour and cornmeal, everybody's getting the iron. And this is not a good thing. There have been countries that have done this and have stopped doing it. Um, so, that is an, another way. If, if you are eating some kind of iron fortified food, does this o somehow override um, hormonal control mechanisms so that you absorb a lot more of it? Um, so this is one reason that iron accumulates. There could be, as we've seen in lab animals, um, they tend to accumulate iron too. So there could be something in, in particular going on with aging that results in, in the accumulation of iron or, or vice versa. The, the accumulation of iron is accelerating their aging. So this, this all works together. I, I think the point, the point for people to know is that we can't, we basically cannot get rid of iron. Uh, um, in, in any kind of natural way. There, there are ways to, there are ways to get rid of it like blood donation. Um, and there are ways to inhibit its, its absorption. But for example, somebody who, somebody, let, let's say somebody had metabolic syndrome, they were overweight. Um, and then they decided to get in sh and they, then they accumulate a, a, a certain amount of iron, excess iron. But then they decide to get in shape they lose weight, they, you know, start exercising, eating right, all this kind of thing. And that's great, but they still have the iron in their systems that they accumulated from their previous condition. So that's, that's what people have to look at. There is, um, Leo Zakarsky, the late Leo Zakarsky wrote a great, um, wrote a great paper about ferritin levels in adults in the United States. What he found was there was a steady rise. So ferritin is the iron storage hormone. It's the best way of measuring body iron stores. There was a rise in ferritin um, into uh, up, up till about the age of 60 or 65 or so. And then ferritin started declining on average uh, and then the oldest, the oldest group in this study, they were looking at were like about at age 90. So ferritin went up to about age 65 and then declined to about age 90. So the easy, the seems the simplest explanation for this rise. And then the subsequent decline being because the people with high ferritin died. Um, and so they were no longer represented, represented among the averages. Have you seen any kind of study on centenarians wh where they have like lower iron levels? Or... Yeah, yes, uh, not centenarians in particular, but I have seen uh, there is a study that looked at, uh, there's a study, the Zutphen study um, was looking at a, a lot of um, the elderly people in the Netherlands. And um, they compared uh, ferritin levels in these uh, people in the Netherlands, the elderly in the Netherlands with people of the same age in Crete, um, which is known to have a lower mortality from heart disease and cancer and so on. And the people, the elderly people in Crete had about 
half the ferritin levels as the people uh, in the Netherlands did. 